behavior. I don't know if you can use the point pen or not. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Trancatella. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna be lecturing today on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy options. And this is a lecture that I had done a while back and I've added uh, some more information in here just to deepen your knowledge. And I know that for the people listening out there, some are practitioners and some are um, just the general public who wants some more information about hormone therapy. So um, let's get started. That is me right there. I've been an naturopathic doctor for over 20 years and about 23 now. Um, and uh, co-founder of Integrative Medicine Academy. My focus in my practice has been women's health, adrenal and thyroid issues, autoimmune disorders and GI disorders. I like to do a lot of detox, optimize gut function because it all links together. So if we can be healthy overall, we can have more balanced hormones. All right, so let me go back. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna be speaking today a lot about different hormone delivery options and uh, why it matters because there's a number of ways hormones can be administered. And when we do any kind of objective follow-up, when we're giving hormones, whether they're bioidentical or whether they're pharmaceutical or synthetic, we need to know which test to use to monitor the level of hormones because that test or the type of test is going to be determined by how those hormones are administered. So we want to make sure that we're choosing a test that is appropriate for the mode of delivery of the hormones that we're using. So these are our options. Um, hormones can be delivered either oral, transdermal. Those are the most common and the ones that most people are familiar with but they can also be delivered sublingually, transbuccally, which is basically where you take a little trochee or a lozenge and you place it between uh, your gum and your cheek and allow it to dissolve. Um, they can be delivered transvaginally or through subcutaneous pellets. That's a very uh, common and favored form of delivery these days because it's basically uh, a no brainer. You just get these pellets put in under your skin and they are slowly absorbed over time and they can last, depending on the hormones and the size and the delivery method, um, they, are, uh, they can last anywhere from three to six months. So they're a favored form of hormone delivery and they're usually bioidentical hormones. And then we have injectables. Some can be administered rectally because it's very vascular or intranasally. And I'm not really going to discuss those because those aren't very common modes of delivery uh, for daily use of hormones. So with estrogen, um, these are all the, form, the ways that it can be delivered. Um, I don't recommend usually oral delivery of estrogen because of the first pass through the liver. Uh, what ends up happening is you increase a lot of binding proteins, in particular sex hormone binding globulin, and that decreases the bioavailability to anywhere between five to 10%. So what you're doing is you have to take higher oral dosages of hormones in order to get a little bit of it before it gets bound up. Also, you're relying on your digestive tract to be able to absorb those hormones. And the amount that is absorbed can vary between individuals um, greatly depending on what's going on in their gut and how well they absorb things across the uh, mucosal membrane of their digestive tract. You also can deliver estrogen transdermally, transbuccally, sublingually, transvaginally, and through subcutaneous pellets. Transdermal delivery has moderate bioavailability. Uh, transbuccal, sublingual, and transvaginal have of high bioavailability because you're basically administering the hormone over a very thin membrane that tends to be very vascular. So you get quick absorption that way. And with the subcutaneous pellets, those are also, they also have high bioavailability because uh, of the way they're administered under the skin and they have a slow and steady delivery that keeps the hormones uh, pretty stable. Progesterone is probably one of the only hormones, uh, if it's bioidentical progesterone, that can be delivered orally for the purpose of um, increasing GABA production. One of the metabolites of progesterone, allopregnenolone, 
is um, stimulates GABA production in the brain. So it can be used a lot, especially in menopausal women who are having difficulty sleeping. So it serves a secondary purpose uh, in that regard because it can help with sleep issues related to menopause or um, if, if anyone has luteal phase deficit, of progesterone output, taking oral progesterone can certainly help uh, calm our mood and also help with sleep. Uh, in terms of transdermal delivery, it also has moderate bioavailability um, and high bioavailability uh, through all of the other methods. With testosterone, nobody really takes testosterone orally. It's not administered that way for the same reason really that estrogen should not be administered orally because of the first pass through the liver. Um, you would get a great increase in binding proteins like sex hormone binding globulin. And um, it's that oral administration increases conversion of testosterone to DHT, which is the more potent form of testosterone. And there is some literature stating that uh, oral dosing of testosterone may be associated with liver cancer. So it just is not administered that way. In the conventional medical world, um, testosterone can be given um, through injections, usually like once a month uh, for men. And it has good bioavailability, um, but it's usually the uh, synthetic testosterone form. Um, in terms of transdermal administration, it's got about 18 to 14% bioavailability. Um, and if men are using the uh, transdermal delivery option, um, they, there are patches that are available, but they're usually placed on the scrotal skin. So that could be um, kind of uncomfortable. The administration of it, not so bad. It's the removal of a patch that might cause some discomfort, but there is pretty good absorption if it is applied there. Um, it can also be delivered transvaginally. Um, and again, as I mentioned, through injectables and the subcutaneous pellets. So with oral delivery, um, the products that you would generally see are in a tablet or capsule form. Um, they can be bioidentical hormones, which you can have specifically compounded at a compounding pharmacy, and they can put it together at any dosage that you, uh, that you request. Um, and it could be a single hormone, it could be estradiol, or it could be delivered as biased, uh, which is estriol and estradiol. Um, the pharmaceutical products uh, that come as a tablet or capsule are obviously usually pre-made. So the dosages that you get are what they come in. So you can't make that choice and customize things. Um, and obviously we're familiar with oral contraceptive pills. Uh, so you have various dosage options, um, both between bioidentical and pharmaceutical products. Uh, they can be combined or separate. So you can uh, get any kind of combination through bioidentical hormones that are compounded, um, or there are some products that are like PremPro, which is Premarin and Provera, um, that are used in menopause and have the synthetic estrogen. Well, not synthetic really, they would call it maybe a natural estrogen, but it is equine estrogen and the synthetic progesterone. Absorption, again, it varies amongst individuals. So it can be anywhere between five to 10% when taken orally because of the absorption across the uh, gastrointestinal mucosa making its way back to the liver and then gets bound up there. So um, it really not great absorption. So you have to do higher dosages. Um, you know, so we have to take these things into, consider into consideration when doing oral dosing. Again, it is not my preferred form of delivering estrogen especially. Uh, progesterone is fine if you're trying to induce relaxation or sleep. So the pros uh, to oral delivery, it's easy to take, you know, I mean, it's just swallowing a pill. Um, it's one of the most researched forms of hormone delivery, um, at least in the past. There's definitely a lot of comparison studies out there looking at the comparison of oral versus transdermal delivery, which is probably the next best option. And, um, you know, so they, they, we do know that the cons related to taking an oral estrogen especially will increase clotting issues. 
increased chance of stroke, uh, gallbladder issues is a big one, and it can increase cholesterol and other inflammatory markers. Um, binding proteins, again, as I mentioned, it increases sex hormone binding globulin, which not only binds up hormones, it can also bind up thyroid hormone. So not only binding up sex hormones, but thyroid hormone as well. And uh, that's not a good thing because then we can start to present with low uh, symptoms of low thyroid. Oral estrogens also can be hard on the liver because of the need for clearance and detoxification. It's a lot of hormone passing through your liver that the liver has to uh, detoxify, process, and clear from your system. And they often present with more side effects like breast tenderness, nausea, headaches, and vaginal discharge. So with transdermal delivery, um, these products come in either a cream or a gel or patches. Um, you have various dosage options available in both compounded and pharmaceutical forms. Um, as again, with compounded formulas, you can get whichever dosage you request. They can make it uh, to your specifications. Um, patches are generally uh, the pharmaceutical option, but in terms of estrogen, most of the patches out there do contain uh, bioidentical estradiol. So like uh, Clamara um, and the Vivelle Dot are both bioidentical estradiol patches. And their absorption, again, can vary amongst individuals. Um, some people just don't absorb transdermal products well. There are those people out there. Uh, other people, they do fine with it. And I would say that that is the majority. People um, can usually do fine with a transdermal delivery, but there are just some people that it just doesn't seem to work very well for whatever reason. Um, in general, the absorption tends to be good, though not as well studied as the oral hormones, um, and it has moderate bioavailability. So the pros for transdermal delivery, um, it's convenient if you're using the patch for the most part, because these patches can last um, anywhere uh, between three and a half days to a week. So the change out of the patch um, is really, you know, just once or twice a week. So that's not bad. Um, and it's tolerable for women with liver issues. We already know decreased risk of stroke, blood clots, and gallbladder issues because of transdermal delivery. You're not getting that first pass through the liver and it has milder side effects. So, you know, if, if a woman is prone to presenting with more estrogen dominant symptoms, if she is using um, an estradiol patch, um, she's probably gonna tolerate that patch better than she would an oral formulation of estrogen. The cons to the transdermal delivery are potential of skin irritation at the site of application. If, if anybody has any allergic re uh, reaction to any kind of adhesives that are commonly used like in band-aids or whatnot, they may react to the patch. Um, you can get some skin irritation from the cream or the gel, whether that's from a compounding pharmacist or from uh, a regular pharmaceutical product. That is also the benefit of maybe using compounding pharmacies because you can specify what kinds of delivery methods or what you want in the cream. If somebody has an allergic reaction or is sensitive to certain products, they can just leave them out. It may to some degree affect the absorption, but it's better than having some kind of skin ir irritation at the site of the application. Transference removal um, or inaccurate dosing so there can be transference from one person to the other, obviously, if you're using the creams and gels. So they're, you know, usually the practitioner who is recommending a, a cream or a gel to you will hopefully give you some uh, instructions on how to apply the cream, where to apply the cream, to wash your hands thoroughly before or before and after applying the cream and to actually not try to try not to use your hands when applying the cream. Usually um, if we're doing a transdermal, having somebody apply it on the inside of the forearm and then use the other forearm to rub it in along the length of the inside of the forearm. And then perhaps to wear sleeves or something to give it some time to absorb. Um, I would say probably anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour should uh, uh, let you know that the creams or the gels have absorbed thoroughly. The other issue could be um, 
inaccurate dosing. But if you're getting a transdermal cream from a compounding pharmacy, they usually use these little click dosing devices that measure out the right amount fairly accurately. I get concerned when uh, people are buying over the counter, let's say a progesterone cream that usually comes in a little tub and they have a little spoon. And so they're using the spoon to measure out the amount of uh, cream that they want but the dosing can be fairly inaccurate uh, under those circumstances. In the end, it can tend to balance out if you are using an over-the-counter progesterone cream, um, you know, an increase, a slight increase or decrease um, from one day to the next may not be huge for a lot of people. There can be issues with poor adherence of the patch, and this can be true for uh, women who are maybe in and out of water a lot. If they're a swimmer, if they're a surfer, um, or if they exercise a lot, their body heats up a lot, they, um, they sweat a lot, that could be an issue potentially. Um, they would need to avoid excessive heat like in a sauna um, or tanning or tanning beds um, that might cause the patch to release too much of the hormone too quickly. So it may not last as long. Um, and the other issue is uh, progesterone. And this was, this was an issue a long time ago when progesterone creams really first came out. I would say probably about 20 years ago, women were just slathering it on and thinking it was the best thing since sliced bread because it made them feel better. It made them feel calmer. And this was premenopausal women um, who were using it inappropriately because they were using it throughout their entire cycle. So you can get a bioaccumulation of progesterone in the subcutaneous fat with daily administration. So it's important to make sure that the progesterone that is being dosed through transdermal delivery is a physiological dose and that perhaps you give your body a break of anywhere between three to five days per month to make sure that progesterone has a chance to clear out of that subcutaneous fat so you're not getting this additive effect every day that you're using it. And it's not appropriate really for women to be using it in the follicular phase of their menstrual cycle because if they're using a high dose, they may um, be, they may prevent ovulation from occurring. So those are some of the things that, or the concerns that I have when women are just going and getting an over-the-counter product and just slathering it on without really understanding how it should be used cyclically. Okay, so sublingual delivery. Um, I like sublingual products um, because there's no chance of transferring it from one person to the other for the most part. And these products are delivered either as liquids or through tablets or trochies. And a trochie is like a lozenge. And these are generally made through compounding pharmacies that can uh, compound these formulas, again, at your specifications um, in terms of dosage of hormones. And you can put more than one hormone in each product. So you could do estrogen, testosterone, and you could do um, progesterone. So um, they can have one or more hormones in them. The route of delivery is usually through the large blood vessels under the tongue, and it's a fairly thin mucosa under your tongue, and those blood vessels are, are close to the surface. So you, you do get rapid absorption, especially with the liquids. Um, the trochees tend to absorb a little slower because they're dissolving at a slower rate, um, and they do have fairly high bioavailability. So the pros are rapid absorption, high bioavailability, um, lower dosing options because of direct delivery into the blood vessels. So you can you can dose them fairly low. Um, you can do you can dose more frequently. So for some women who have issues with, you know, if they're doing a full daily dose of hormone and their goal is to just apply it or use it once a day, but they find that the effects of that hormone wear off perhaps doing a sublingual delivery, sublingual or transbuchal, to me, they're kind of the same. Um, might work better for her where she can break her dosage down into uh, three, two to three different dosages throughout the day to kind of keep the level stable. So you can dose more frequently to manage symptoms, which is a good option for a lot of women. Um, it's good for conditions that are related to perhaps sharp drops in estrogen. So women who get um, uh, migraines that are perhaps related to a certain phase within their cycle, some women can get 
uh, migraine headaches right after ovulation where estrogen has dropped off sharply. Um, so that is a hormone induced migraine. So um, sublingual delivery of estrogen can be used that way in perhaps the mid um, phase of the menstrual cycle to kind of buffer the drop off of the um, estrogen and perhaps prevent a migraine. And it only needs to be dosed maybe for like three days to try and keep that buffer going. So that's one of the uses of sublingual delivery. So you have you know, the, the ease of dosing, uh, using it for things other than menopause. And so it's, you know, it's a good option for dosing. The cons are that because it is so rapidly absorbed uh, and metabolized, the, it has a shorter duration of effect. So quick absorption, quick action, quick metabolism. So you do need to dose more frequently to keep levels stable. Um, some of it will be swallowed because it's in your mouth and anything you put in your mouth is going to generate production of saliva and you're going to naturally want to swallow it. Um, but it's, it's fairly mild. You know, a lot of people worry about doing sublinguals and trochies thinking, you know, is a good percentage of this turning into an oral product. Um, but because these aren't meant to be taken orally. They're not encapsulated or in some kind of tablet that prevents breakdown or deactivation in the stomach because of hydrochloric acid. It's not like you're going to get a huge amount that uh, becomes an oral form. Okay, so transbuchal delivery. Again, this is just really taking a lozenge or a trochee or a tablet and putting it between uh, your gum and your cheek. So it kind of slows down the um, breakdown and absorption of the product. So you get a little bit slower absorption than you would with maybe a sublingual uh, liquid or even a trochee uh, because it's, you're probably not gonna get as much saliva generated up against your cheek. Um, the, the absorption is similar to sublingual, but the mucosa is slightly thicker than the sublingual area. So it might be a little bit slower. Um, you do get some absorption um, across that mucosal membrane like you do sublingually. Um, and the reason that these are good forms of delivery is because these areas are so vascular. The pros are that you get rapid absorption, high bioavailability, uh, lower dosing options um, because of rapid absorption. Um, you have the option to dose more frequently to manage symptoms. Um, and that's, that's a good option for people who tend to metabolize their hormones quickly. And if you're doing a single high dose a day, um, maybe it's too much for them. Maybe they do better if they have lower dosages spread out through the day. Um, and if they're okay with doing that, if they're okay with dosing their hormones two to three times a day, then that's fine. Um, the cons are that usually in a trochee form, um, they can dissolve slowly. So for some people, it really depends on what the trochee is made of. If it's really hard, like a hard candy, it's going to take a lot longer to dissolve. But if it's made with something like um, coconut oil, um, it will dissolve usually a little faster. So you don't have to worry about keeping this thing in your mouth for too long. For some people, depending on what the ingredients of the trochee are, it may cause some irritation between the cheek and the gum, um, but I find this not to be a really big deal. Um, may become an oral product, again, as I mentioned before. Um, that can change by the size of the trochee um, and getting quicker absorption. I use trochees myself, and what I do is I double the dose in each trochee, and I just take half a trochee, so I have a smaller trochee. Um, and it works just fine. All right, so transvaginal delivery. Um, they can come in the form of creams or pre-made suppositories uh, or tablets or a, a ring. There is a vaginal ring that delivers um, estrogen and this is a pharmaceutical product. Um, and these products um, have very good absorption. Um, you do not get a first pass through the liver uh, because it's not being swallowed. Um, and you get absorption into the vagina, which has a localized effect for people, for women who have vaginal atrophy or dryness, or they're experiencing increased uh, urinary tract infections um, because of uh, a loss of integrity of the tissue in the vaginal area because they don't have enough estrogen around to keep the tissue supple and thick and uh, preventing them from uh, 
getting infections in that area. So it can be used locally. Transvaginal delivery can be used just to address vaginal atrophy, um, or it can be used as a systemic delivery method, usually in higher dosages. So the pros are um, it has local as well as systemic effects. Um, good absorption, so you can use lower dosages. It can be dosed twice weekly for local effect or daily for a systemic effect. So, you know, once you get that vaginal tissue back to being comfortable, um, you know, you may have to dose daily for a week or two, and then you can drop it down to um, maybe just twice a week once the tissue is, has uh, rejuvenated itself somewhat. The cons are that there's obviously going to be potential transfers, transference to a partner. So you have to consider the timing of use, you know, try and do it at the opposite end of the day um, as to opposed to when you might be having intercourse. So that's always something to think about. Um, potential to increase thickness of the endometrium. So it's best to use estrogen with progesterone. So um, the products, the dosing for a product that is just going to have like a localized effect may just by proximity have some effect on the endometrium. So um, it's good to just make sure if you still have a uterus that perhaps if you're dosing with a little bit of estrogen um, to make sure that you're not getting any kind of endometrial thickness um, because you're not using any progesterone. If a woman has a uterus and you are supplementing with hormones in menopause, you need to be on some form of progesterone along with that because of the chance of the estrogen increasing endometrial thickness. And then you could potentially have a bleed at some point, which is not a bad thing because you're at least bleeding off the, the thickened endometrial lining. Um, but it also is very stimulating into the cells within the endometrium. Um, and so progesterone tends to oppose that and opposes the effects of estrogen on that level. And subcutaneous pellets. So this is, um, this is a popular mode of delivery because you don't have to think about um, your hormones for anywhere between three and six months. But um, you know, it does require a skilled medical professional to actually make the incision and put them under your skin. And they're basically just little pellets of compressed hormones. And the absorption for these is very good, 95 to 100% absorbed. Um, and it will show a high level of circulating estrogen. So they're, um, they have high bioavailability. The pros, obviously no daily applications. So you, there's no worry about forgetting anything or having to think about um, applying your hormones or taking your hormones. Um, and the pellets can last anywhere between three and six months. Um, and it has a fairly consistent daily release of hormones. So there's a lot of stability in the dosing because it's under your skin. It's got to pass through the subcutaneous fat into the interstitial space and then it's picked up. And so it has this slow, consistent release. The cons are that needs to be implanted by a trained medical professional. So you have to actually go and pay to have it done. Um, and it is, a, it is a procedure. It's not just the use of a, a medication. You do get higher release of hormones initially, potentially, and a lower release as the hormones are towards the end of their life. So um, initially, there might be a feeling of too much hormone, and then it'll kind of um, plateau. And then towards the end of the life of the implant, you may not feel the hormones as much. You may feel that the effects are wearing off. So it can cause some hormone receptor downregulation. Um, and what that means is that when you use a high amount of hormone, um, the bodies, the cells that receive that hormone have receptors on their surfaces to bring the hormone into the cells to direct those cells um, to do what they're supposed to do. If you have too much hormone around and the cells are already have what they need, they, those receptors will downregulate. So they recede. So you don't get too much hormone directing those cells. And that can happen initially if you have too much hormone flooding the system, the cells will downregulate. And then it almost has this, um, this reactive effect where you almost feel like even though you're taking some hormones, um, that you have a hormone deficiency because you can only utilize 
what you have receptors for. So um, that could happen potentially with the subcutaneous pellets if you get too much of a release early on, um, but it does tend to level out over time. So women seem to think that um, that is not a huge issue. That can be an issue though, if women are using um, too high a dosage of other forms of hormones. So that can happen under any circumstance, subcutaneous pellet, transdermal, oral, if you're taking too much of a hormone, your body's gonna downregulate those hormone um, receptors because it's already had enough of that hormone. The other con to this is that there's no flexibility in hormone dosing. So if you have these pellets implanted and you feel like it's way too much for you, um, you can't just change, change your dosage the next day. I mean, you could certainly go and have the, the pellets taken out if it's that uncomfortable, but you know, you don't have the chance every 24 hours to change and modify your dosing. All right, so testing options. And I think this is important because using hormones is an art and a science. And so we have to know how to make the most of what we're doing. Um, and we have to always consider the route of administration before considering which hormone test to use, because that's our objective data that we're referring to that's giving us information about, you know, hormone levels with our patients, whether it's a baseline level or whether we're monitoring them uh, while they're undergoing therapy with any kind of hormone replacement therapy. The other part of that, and I think it's important too, is um, subjective data. How is your patient feeling? Do they understand the symptoms of excess and deficiency of hormones? What I will often do is give patients um, these handouts that I have that basically outline uh, symptoms of hormone excess and deficiency so that we can communicate with the same language. They understand what hormones of excess and deficiency are, and they may not if you don't let them know. Uh, they may experience a symptom, but they may not realize that it is from an excess or a deficiency of a hormone. So it allows you to communicate with the same language if you share that information with them. It's important to do baseline testing because it helps to identify where the patient's levels were before they started HRT. Because if you don't know where you started, um, if you just do a follow-up test once you start um, hormone replacement therapy, you're not gonna know how far you've come or how far you need to go um, with this particular patient. So getting baseline values I think is meaningful. It also helps because sometimes we may misinterpret what their symptoms are. You know, So we may understand symptoms of hormone and deficiency, but oftentimes um, hormone excess can sometimes present um, with symptoms of deficiency for the reason that I explained when you have a down regulation of those receptors. So you need to know where you're starting to know where you need to go. So baseline testing is important. Um, Follow-up hormone levels should be compared to ranges for supplementation if provided. So a lot of the labs that we use, whether it's measuring through saliva or blood spot or serum, or urine um, will have different um, ranges of normal if, if you're supplementing with hormones because they're metabolized differently than endogenous hormones. So you always wanna look for that. And you always wanna refer back to the patient's symptoms as I mentioned before, have they improved? Relate the clinical picture to the lab results that you're seeing to see if you need to make any changes. So this is a table um, that um, is available through ZRT Laboratory. This was put together by Dr. Zava. And I found this to be incredibly useful because early on when I was starting to do some hormone replacement therapy with patients, and I don't think we knew 20 years ago, you know, which testing was optimal um, depending on the route of delivery. So this information neatly compiled into a nice little table, I think is very useful because it says if you're using a certain type of um, mode of delivery or route of administration for a hormone, which of these body fluids is going to give you the best information? And if it's appropriate to actually use that uh, body fluid to test in terms of the route of delivery that you're using. 
So this table is very useful in that it helps us to make that decision by, you know, saying, okay, if somebody is doing a topical steroid, should I use serum testing? And the answer would be no. And the reason would be, if you look under number two, because it's greatly underestimated and is not reflective of tissue uptake. And I have seen this personally a lot. Um, there's a a lot of patients out there want to get everything covered by their insurance, so they want to do serum testing um, if they're doing transdermal hormones, but the transdermal hormones barely budge um, in serum measurements, and so we don't really get a good representation of what's going on at the tissue level. So you could have patients that are feeling a lot better, but it is certainly not reflected in the serum levels of the hormones. So you, again, you have to choose the right test for the right route of administration. Um, and this is available on ZRT's website. So um, I find it to be very useful in helping me to make decisions on which tests are gonna be appropriate. So I'm gonna go into a little deeper um, reasoning as to why these things are. Let's first look at serum testing. If you're taking oral hormones, they tend to be overestimated because there's a lot of cross-reactivity of inactive hormone metabolites with standard immunoassays. So it picks up on a lot of uh, chatter, background chatter of different metabolites of the hormones. So it can be overrepresented. Um, most of these orally delivered hormones are going to be um, metabolized into inert compounds before they reach their general circulation and target tissue. So it's not really representative of what is actually getting into the tissue. With topical hormones, as I mentioned, it's underestimated because you know, a lot of this transdermal hormone, it enters lymphatic capillaries, not blood capillaries. And um, so it's not picked up in the serum. So it goes to its tissue, it does its job, and it, you're not necessarily going to pick it up in venous uh, serum. With vaginal hormones, the measurements are really going to be dose dependent. Um, a higher dose of vaginal hormones may have systemic effects, while lower dosages are going to be intended to support the vaginal tissue. Um, so that higher tissue uptake is generally not going to be reflected in the serum. With trochees and sublinguals, you might get some good representation, but because they're metabolized so quickly, um, it's generally not, go you really have to do the timing just right um, and get it you know, at the peak of the dosing. And if you're dosing two or three times a day, it's kind of hard to jump in and get a serum test is that is gonna be fully representative of what is getting in at the tissue level. With pellets, they, they tend to be well represented in serum, um, likely because it saturates those capillary beds and you get a constant and steady dosage um, that is going on for anywhere between three and six months. So it tends to measure well in serum. With saliva testing, um, oral hormones can generally be overestimated. Uh, so there's generally a need for range adjustment. So if somebody is taking oral hormones and they're doing a saliva test, usually the lab will give a reference range that is appropriate because things get picked up differently. With topical hormones, there is a potential of overestimating. Um, so there is a need for range adjustment. We know what that looks like in saliva. So we know what the ranges um, are that need to be, what it needs to be adjusted to so that it can correlate with what is considered normal. Um, topically delivered hormones usually get absorbed through the lymphatics and is not immediately bound to carrier proteins in the blood. So there's a greater availability of free and unbound hormones. So when we're doing saliva testing, if you're familiar with saliva testing, we're really measuring the free fraction of the hormone. With vaginally administered uh, hormones, Likely dose dependent, again, it's kind of like the serum. Um, you know, the, if you're just using a vaginal um, dose of hormones to uh, treat vaginal atrophy, it, it may not come up as a systemically high level. Um, with trochees and sublinguals, we really don't want to use saliva testing if you're using a trochee or a sublingual. And I think that's for obvious reasons because it's going to concentrate in the tissue 
upon which it's been administered. So if you put a trochee or a sublingual liquid under your tongue and you're gonna collect saliva from the same area, you may have some hyperconcentration of the hormone in those tissues where you're collecting the saliva. So they're not appropriate for um, measuring uh, trochee or sublingual delivery. With pellet uh, and uh, intramuscular therapy, Accurate measurement of the free fraction of the hormones circulating in the blood, which is available to bind receptors. So you do get a fairly accurate measurement um, when you're doing pellet or IM delivery through saliva. With urine testing, um, urine testing can tend to overestimate hormones that are taken orally because it's measuring the inactive metabolites that are being excreted from the body. Urine is uh, an excretory, excretory fluid. So it's something that we're getting rid of and whatever is in the urine is what your body is trying to get rid of. So 90% of oral hormones are metabolized to these inactive metabolites before reaching target tissues. What is seen in the urine is more representative of excretion than activity. So it's not always representative of what is actually getting to the tissues. With topical steroids, urine testing may underestimate the topically delivered hormones because they're delivered to the target tissues before being converted to inert metabolites and excreted. So we're not always getting tissue representation. And so it may come up kind of low. With vaginal hormones, again, it's sort of like um, using sublingual hormones and then using saliva to measure. With vaginal hormones, there's a good chance that uh, you may have contamination in the urine. So you can get direct contamination of hormones delivered vaginally if you're collecting urine for obvious reasons. Uh, with trochees and sublinguals, um, can be accurate if dosing is frequent enough to keep the blood levels stable. But again, you know, we, it is what you are excreting. And generally when we are dosing um, sublingually or through trochees, um, we're doing lower dosages. So the body can more uh, efficiently metabolize them. So you don't have a lot of excessive metabolites. And with pellets, um, usually can be an overestimation due to the increased metabolites being eliminated through the kidneys. Okay, so dried blood spot. Um, this is a, a form of measuring hormones. A lot, not a lot of people use them, but I actually like using dried blood spot. Um, so with oral hormones, it, the, the results usually correlate pretty well with serum testing. So it's an accurate measurement for orally delivered hormones. With topical steroids, it can be accurate. Um, and it's reflective of what is being taken up by the capillary bed. So that's a good thing. When you're doing a dried blood spot test, you're basically just doing a finger stick and you're expressing blood onto um, paper cards in which they basically just uh, rehydrate that dried blood and then they can measure hormones in the blood. If you are using topical steroids, um, there is a chance of contaminating um, your hands and your fingertips if you're applying it with your hands, which is why I always recommend that people don't use their hands and to apply it directly to the inner part of their forearm or somewhere else where they can maybe use the inside of their forearm to uh, rub the cream in. Um, it has accurate measurement of vaginally delivered hormones as it's reflective of what is available for tissue uptake. Um, and with trochees and sublinguals, um, similar to topical and vaginal delivery, the dried blood spot reflects what is available for tissue uptake when delivered across the oral mucosa. So it gives you a good idea of what is getting into the tissue. And that's the most important thing. We want to get a good representation of what the body is actually using and what's getting into those target tissues. With pellets and IM method, um, dry blood spot is also accurate for measuring hormones because it's like it can be like serum in that way. So um, you know it enters the capillary blood eventually, and it gives you a good idea of how much blood is in circulation and or how much hormone is in circulation and available for tissue uptake. Okay, so when you're choosing a test to run. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting as much information as you can from the test, especially when you're doing baseline testing. So if you're doing a baseline test, I often recommend that you also look at adrenal hormones. You also look at thyroid hormones because that's kind of like the big three. 
um, because women can present with symptoms of hormone excess and deficiency, and it may not be solely related to ovarian production of hormones. It could be related to what's going on with the adrenals having an effect on ovarian function, or it could be related to thyroid function as well. So you wanna make sure that you're treating the right thing. So initially in getting baseline testing, you really wanna get as much information as you can. Um, and so when you look at these different methods of testing, aside from measuring sex hormones, you can see which body fluid will provide you with a good baseline level. So serum testing, and dry blood spot testing can provide you with a lot more than just saliva and urine testing can, because we can look at other um, proteins like LH, FSH, uh, PSA, prolactin. We can look at thyroid hormones. So not only TSH, we can look at free T3, free T4. We can look at thyroid antibodies. We can look at insulin. Uh, we don't have it listed here, but hemoglobin A1C and fasting glucose, um, all of these things that can be related to hormone imbalances. And I do recommend that if you are doing any testing as a baseline before anybody starts uh, doing hormones, just do a good broad spectrum serum test and get as much information as you can up front so that you can make sure that you're either treating the patient appropriately or if you're the patient who's listening, that you're being treated appropriately, like the right thing is being given to you. All right, so symptoms of excess and deficiency. I touched, I touched on this initially when I was just kind of introducing you to the idea of testing, um, but I think it's very important to have a good understanding of symptoms of excess and deficiency, not just of sex hormones, not just of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, but understanding um, symptoms of excess of cortisol, deficiency of cortisol, um, DHEA, uh, thyroid hormone, all of these things, it's important to have a broad spectrum understanding of what those symptoms of deficiency and excess look like because there can be a lot of crossover. So again, uh, knowing what you're treating is really important. So everyone is gonna be different. And while hormone levels may be normal on a lab test, symptoms of excess or deficiency may still be present for that person. So that's where a good history comes in, taking a really good history, going all the way back to uh, Menarche and understanding um, perhaps what this woman's menstrual life has been like. Um, has she had symptoms of estrogen excess for most of her menstruating life? Um, did she have difficulty getting pregnant? Were there times when she was, you know, amenorrheic where she didn't have a period? So you wanna have all of that information up front so you have a really good, broad, foundational picture of what this woman's menstrual life has been like so that you can make decisions based on not only the lab tests, her symptoms, but also her history. You also wanna rule out other contributors like adrenal and thyroid, as I mentioned before, because it's important to treat the right thing. So with all of the hormone options out there, you know, we have pharmaceutical products and we have uh, compounded formulas. Um, this is a really great handout that I uh, frequently refer to from a Women's International Pharmacy. Uh, you can find this on their website under resources, I believe. Um, I don't think they've updated it in a while, but I think it gives you a good idea of dosing of hormones, um, whether they're bioidentical or whether they're pharmaceutical. So it has oral, it has it broken down by the mode of delivery. And it gives you all of the options, bioidentical uh, and pharmaceutical. So you can see how many products are out there, what the dosing regimen is typically. Um, and so it gives you an idea of what the options are. So I find this to be um, very useful. And the same for men in, or, and women, sometimes in using testosterone. Um, you know, sometimes it's better to use compounded formulas so you can do much lower dosing if women have low testosterone. Um, so it's appropriate for women too. But for men, um, as they start to age, testosterone levels will start to drop off. And so it's important to know what the dosing options are for men as well. And so this is a great handout for that. All right, so 
Basically, we just covered the different modes of delivery of hormones and how they can be utilized and uh, what the pros and cons are of each and what delivery form they come in um, and try to pair that up appropriately with the right testing so that you can get good objective data from your patients who are on any form of hormones. We also, through Integrative Medicine Academy, we have a new course starting. Um, the Hormone Mastery course uh, is a nine module course and it is starting on February 22nd. If you are interested in learning more about that course, you can go to integrativemedicineacademy.com and you can look at the different modules and the information that we are going to provide for you in that course. Um, also, if you do not have access to lab tests, whether you're a practitioner out there um, or whether you're a patient who is just curious in doing some testing on yourself, uh, but you can't find a practitioner to order any tests for you, you can go to labtestplus.com and you can order some tests yourself. And these tests will just be delivered to your home. Uh, you don't need a doctor's visit to order them. Each lab is personally reviewed um, and by a doctor, either myself or Dr. Wohler. Um, and a written lab review is provided with some basic recommendations um, and um, maybe some supplement recommendations too, to address the findings on the test. So this is through labtestplus.com. So if you don't have access to somebody to order testing for you, this is a nice option. And if you have questions, um, you can go to labtestplus at gmail.com. And we also have uh, a program called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds. If you are a practitioner um, and you are a sole practitioner or you are needing some one-on-one -on -one time with some experienced functional medicine doctors, uh, Dr. Wooler and I are available through Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds. Um, this is a membership site and we can help with interpretation of tests, troubleshooting, um, we have educational videos, clinical pearls, lab reviews, et cetera. Um, so again, if you are interested in checking that out, please go to functionalmedicineclinicalrounds.com. All right, and that's me. Um, if you have any questions, that is my contact info. I believe that um, if you do have direct questions, they are being collected and I will answer them via a Great Plains email um, at some point this week or early next week if you do have questions. So thanks everybody for listening. I hope you have a great day and happy new year.